Pope St. John Paul II, the 18th of May 1920, the 2nd of April 2005, was the head of the Catholic Church and sovereign of the Vatican city-state from 1978 until his death in 2005. He was elected Pope, by the Second Papal Conclave of 1978, which was called after Pope John Paul I, who had been elected in August, to succeed Pope Paul VI, died after 33 days. Cardinal Vitilla was elected on the third day of the conclave and adopted the name of his predecessor in tribute to him. John Paul II is recognized as helping to end communist rule in his native Poland and the rest of Europe. John Paul II significantly improved the Catholic Church's relations with Judaism, Islam, and the Eastern Orthodox Church. He upheld the Church's teachings on such matters as the right to life, artificial contraception, the ordination of women, and a celibate clergy, and although he supported the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, he was seen as generally conservative in their interpretation. He was one of the most traveled world leaders in history, visiting 129 countries during his pontificate. As part of his special emphasis on the universal call to holiness, he beatified 1,340 and canonized 483 people, more than the combined tally of his predecessors during the preceding five centuries. By the time of his death, he had named most of the College of Cardinals, consecrated or co-consecrated many of the world's bishops, and ordained many priests. John Paul II was the second longest serving pope in modern history after Pope Pius IX. Born in Poland, John Paul II was the first non-Italian pope since the 16th century Pope Adrian VI. John Paul II's cause for canonization commenced one month after his death with the traditional five-year waiting period waived. On 19 December 2009, John Paul II was proclaimed venerable by his successor, Benedict XVI, and was beatified on 1 May 2011 after the Congregation for the Causes of Saints attributed one miracle to his intercession, the healing of a French nun called Marie Simon Pierre from Parkinson's disease. A second miracle was approved on 2 July 2013, and confirmed by Pope Francis two days later. John Paul II was canonized on 27 April 2014, together with Pope John XXIII. On the 11th of September 2014, Pope Francis added these two optional memorials to the worldwide general Roman calendar of saints. It is traditional to celebrate saints' feast days on the anniversary of their deaths, but that of John Paul II is celebrated on the anniversary of his papal inauguration. Posthumously, he has been referred to by some Catholics as Saint John Paul the Great, although the title has no official recognition. Chapter 1 Early Life Karl Józef Wojtyla was born in the Polish town of Wodaus. He was the youngest of three children born to Karl Wojtyla, an ethnic Pole, and Emilia Kaczorowska, who was of distant Lithuanian heritage. Emilia, who was a school teacher, died from a heart attack and kidney failure in 1929 when Wojtyla was eight years old. His elder sister Olga had died before his birth, but he was close to his brother Edmund, nicknamed Mund, who was 13 years his senior. Edmund's work as a physician eventually led to his death from scarlet fever, a loss that affected Vitilla deeply. Vitilla was baptized a month after his birth, made his first communion at age nine, and was confirmed at age eighteen. As a boy, Vitilla was athletic, often playing football as goalkeeper. During his childhood, Vitilla had contact with Wadawis large Jewish community. School football games were often organized between teams of Jews and Catholics, and Vitilla often played on the Jewish side. I remember that at least a third of my classmates at elementary school in Wadawis were Jews. At elementary school there were fewer. With some I was on very friendly terms. And what struck me about some of them was their Polish patriotism. It was around this time that the young Karl had his first serious relationship with a girl. He became close to a girl called Ginka Beer, described as a Jewish beauty, with stupendous eyes and jet black hair, slender, a superb actress. In mid-1938, 
Voitilla and his father left Wadawis and moved to Krakow, where he enrolled at the Jagiellonian University. While studying such topics as philology and various languages, he worked as a volunteer librarian and was required to participate in compulsory military training in the Academic Legion, but he refused to fire a weapon. He performed with various theatrical groups and worked as a playwright. During this time, his talent for language blossomed, and he learned as many as fifteen languages, Polish, Latin, Italian, English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, German, Luxembourgish, Dutch, Ukrainian, Serbo-Croatian, Czech, Slovak, and Esperanto, nine of which he used extensively as Pope. In 1939, the German occupation forces closed the university after invading Poland. Able-bodied males were required to work, so from 1940 to 1944 Wojtyla variously worked as a messenger for a restaurant, a manual laborer in a limestone quarry and for the Solvay chemical factory, to avoid deportation to Germany. In February 1940, he met Jan Tyronowski who introduced him to Carmelite mysticism, and the Living Rosary youth groups. Also in 1940 he was struck by a tram, suffering a fractured skull. The same year he was hit by a lorry in a quarry, which left him with one shoulder higher than the other and a permanent stoop. His father, a former Austro-Hungarian non-commissioned officer and later officer in the Polish army, died of a heart attack in 1941, leaving Wojtyla as the immediate family's only surviving member. I was not at my mother's death, I was not at my brother's death, I was not at my father's death, he said, reflecting on these times of his life, nearly forty years later, at twenty, I had already lost all of the people I loved. After his father's death, he started thinking seriously about the priesthood. In October 1942, while the war continued, he knocked on the door of the bishop's palace in Krakow and asked to study for the priesthood. Soon after, he began courses in the clandestine underground seminary run by the Archbishop of Krakow, Adam Stefan Cardinal Sarpieha. On 29 February 1944, Wojtyla was hit by a German truck. German Wehrmacht officers tended to him and sent him to a hospital. He spent two weeks there recovering from a severe concussion and a shoulder injury. It seemed to him that this accident and his survival was a confirmation of his vocation. On 6 August 1944, a day known as Black Sunday, the Gestapo rounded up young men in Krakow to curtail the uprising there, similar to the recent uprising in Warsaw. Wojtyla escaped by hiding in the basement of his uncle's house, at 10 Tynieka Street, while the German troops searched above. More than 8,000 men and boys were taken that day, while Wojtyla escaped to the Archbishop's palace, where he remained until after the Germans had left. Dot on the night of 17 January 1945, the Germans fled the city, and the students reclaimed the ruined seminary. Wojtyla and another seminarian volunteered for the task of clearing away piles of frozen excrement from the toilets. Wojtyla also helped a 14-year-old Jewish refugee girl named Edith Zira, who had escaped from a Nazi labor camp in Chensterhofer. Edith had collapsed on a railway platform, so Wojtyla carried her to a train and stayed with her throughout the journey to Krakow. Edith credits Wojtyla with saving her life that day. Bene Brith and other authorities have said that Wojtyla helped protect many other Polish Jews from the Nazis. During the Nazi occupation of Poland, a Jewish family sent their son, Stanley Berger, to be hidden by a Gentile Polish family. Berger's biological Jewish parents died during the Holocaust, and after the war Berger's new Christian parents asked Karol Wojtyla, the future Pope John Paul II, to baptize the boy. Wojtyla refused, saying that the child should be raised in the Jewish faith of his birth parents and nation, not as a Catholic. He did everything he could to ensure that Berger leave Poland to be raised by his Jewish relatives in the United States. In April 2005, shortly after John Paul II's death, the Israeli government created a commission to honor the legacy of John Paul II. One of the ways of honor, proposed by Emmanuel Pacifici, the head of Italy's Jewish community, was the Medal of the Righteous Among the Nations. In Voitilla's last book, 
memory and identity, he described the twelve years of the Nazi regime as bestiality, quoting from the Polish theologian and philosopher Konstanty Michalski. Chapter 2 Presbyterate? After finishing his studies at the seminary in Krakow, Wojtyla was ordained as a priest on All Saints' Day, 1 November 1946, by the Archbishop of Krakow, Cardinal Sapieha. Sapieha sent Wojtyla to Rome's Pontifical International Athenaeum Angelicum, the future Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, to study under the French Dominican Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange beginning on 26 November 1946. He resided in the Belgian Pontifical College during this time, under presidency of M. Jean-Maximilien de Furstenberg. Wojtyla earned a license in July 1947, passed his doctoral exam on 14 June 1948, and successfully defended his doctoral thesis titled Doctrina de Fidea Pud Sioana Macrus in Philosophy on 19 June 1948. The Angelicum preserves the original copy of Wojtyla's typewritten thesis. Among other courses at the Angelicum, Wojtyla studied Hebrew with the Dutch Dominican Peter G. Duncker, author of the Compendium Grammaticae Linguae Hebraicae Biblici. According to Wojtyla's schoolmate, the future Austrian Cardinal Alphonse Stickler, in 1947 during his sojourn at the Angelicum, Wojtyla visited Padre Pio, who heard his confession and told him that one day he would ascend to the highest post in the Church. Cardinal Stickler added that Wojtyla believed, that the prophecy was fulfilled when he became a cardinal. Wojtyla returned to Poland in the summer of 1948 for his first pastoral assignment in the village of Niegawik, 24 kilometers from Krakow, at the Church of the Assumption. He arrived at Niegawik at harvest time, where his first action was to kneel and kiss the ground. He repeated this gesture, which he adapted from the French Saint Jean Marie Baptiste Vianney, throughout his papacy. In March 1949, Wojtyla was transferred to the parish of St. Florian in Krakow. He taught ethics at Jagiellonian University, and subsequently at the Catholic University of Lublin. While teaching, he gathered a group of about 20 young people, who began to call themselves Rajinka, the little family. They met for prayer, philosophical discussion, and to help the blind and sick. The group eventually grew to approximately 200 participants, and their activities expanded to include annual skiing and kayaking trips. In 1953, Wojtyla's habilitation thesis was accepted by the Faculty of Theology at the Jagiellonian University. In 1954, he earned a doctorate in sacred theology, evaluating the feasibility of a Catholic ethic based on the ethical system of the phenomenologist Max Scheler with a dissertation titled Re-evaluation of the Possibility of Founding a Catholic Ethic on the Ethical System of Max Scheler. Scheler was a German philosopher who founded a broad philosophical movement that emphasized the study of conscious experience. However, the communist authorities abolished the Faculty of Theology at the Jagiellonian University, thereby preventing him from receiving the degree until 1957. Wojtyla developed a theological approach, called phenomenological Thomism, that combined traditional Catholic Thomism with the ideas of personalism, a philosophical approach deriving from phenomenology, which was popular among Catholic intellectuals in Krakow during Wojtyla's intellectual development. He translated Scheler's formalism, and the ethics of substantive values. In 1961, he coined Thomistic personalism to describe Aquinas's philosophy. During this period, Wojtyla wrote a series of articles in Krakow's Catholic newspaper, Tygodnik Pauseczny, dealing with contemporary church issues. He focused on creating original literary work during his first dozen years as a priest. War, life under communism, and his pastoral responsibilities all fed his poetry and plays. Wojtyla published his work under two pseudonyms, Andrzej Joyan and Stanislav Andrzej Gruder, to distinguish his literary from his religious writings, and also so that his literary works would be considered on their merits. In 1960, Wojtyla published the influential theological book Love and Responsibility, a defense of traditional church teachings on marriage from a new philosophical standpoint. While a priest in Krakow, groups of students regularly joined Wojtyla for hiking, skiing, bicycling, camping and kayaking, accompanied by prayer, 
outdoor masses and theological discussions. In Stalinist era Poland, it was not permitted for priests to travel with groups of students. Wojtyla asked his younger companions to call him Wojek to prevent outsiders from deducing he was a priest. The nickname gained popularity among his followers. In 1958, when Wojtyla was named Auxiliary Bishop of Krakow, his acquaintances expressed concern that this would cause him to change. Wojtyla responded to his friends, Wojek will remain Wojek, and he continued to live a simple life, shunning the trappings that came with his position as bishop. This beloved nickname stayed with Wojtyla for his entire life and continues to be affectionately used, particularly by the Polish people. Chapter 3, Episcopate and Cardinalate Chapter 4 Section 1, Call to the Episcopate On the 4th of July 1958, while Wojtyla was on a kayaking holiday in the lakes region of northern Poland, Pope Pius XII appointed him as the Auxiliary Bishop of Krakow. He was then summoned to Warsaw to meet the Primate of Poland. Stefan Cardinal Wyszynski, who informed him of his appointment. He agreed to serve as Auxiliary Bishop to Krakow's Archbishop Evgeniusz Bozyak, and he received Episcopal consecration on 28 September 1958. Bozyak was the principal consecrator. Principal co-consecrators were Bishop Boleslav Kormanek and then Auxiliary Bishop Franciszek Jop of the Catholic Diocese of San Domiusz. At the age of 38, Wojtyla became the youngest bishop in Poland. In 1959, Bishop Wojtyla began an annual tradition of saying a midnight mass on Christmas Day in an open field at Nauwahuta, the so-called model workers' town outside Krakow that was without a church building. Wojtyla died in June 1962 and on 16 July Wojtyla was selected as vicar capitular of the archdiocese until an archbishop could be appointed. Chapter 4 Section 2 Participation in Vatican II and Subsequent Events In October 1962, Wojtyla took part in the Second Vatican Council, where he made contributions to two of its most historic and influential products, the Decree on Religious Freedom and the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. Wojtyla and the Polish bishops contributed a draft text at the Council for Gaudium et Spes. According to the historian John W. O'Malley, the draft text Gaudium et Spes that Wojtyla and the Polish delegation sent had some influence on the version that was sent to the Council Fathers that summer but was not accepted as the based text. According to John F. Crosby, as Pope, John Paul II used the words of Gaudium et Spes later to introduce his own views on the nature of the human person in relation to God, man is the only creature on earth that God has wanted for its own sake, but man can fully discover his true self only in a sincere giving of himself. He also participated in the assemblies of the Synod of Bishops. On 13 January 1964, Pope Paul VI appointed him Archbishop of Krakow. On 26 June 1967, Paul VI announced Archbishop Karol Wojtyla's promotion to the Sacred College of Cardinals. Wojtyla was named Cardinal Priest of the Titulus of San Cesario in Palatio. In 1967, he was instrumental in formulating the encyclical Humanae Vitae, which dealt with the same issues that forbid abortion and artificial birth control. According to a contemporary witness, Cardinal Wojtyla was against the distribution of a letter around Krakow in 1970, stating that the Polish Episcopate was preparing for the 50th anniversary of the Polish Soviet War. In 1973, Cardinal Wojtyla met philosopher Anna Teresa Tymieniecka, the wife of Hendrik S. Hauthacker, professor of economics at Stanford University and Harvard University, and member of President Nixon's Council of Economic Advisers. Tymieniecka collaborated with Wojtyla on a number of projects, including an English translation of Wojtyla's book Osoba Eisen. Person and Act, one of Pope John Paul II's foremost literary works, was initially written in Polish. Tymieniecka produced the English-language version. They corresponded over the years, and grew to be good friends. When Wojtyla visited New England in the summer of 1976, Tymieniecka put him up as a guest in her family home. Wojtyla enjoyed his holiday in Pomfret, 
Vermont kayaking and enjoying the outdoors, as he had done in his beloved Poland but during 1974-1975, then Cardinal Wojtyla, the Archbishop of Krakow, served Pope Paul VI as consultor to the Pontifical Council for the Laity, as recording secretary for the 1974 Synod on Evangelism, and by participating extensively in the original drafting of the 1975 Apostolic Exhortation, Evangelii in Antiandi. Chapter 4, Papacy? Chapter 5 Section 1, Election. In August 1978, following the death of Pope Paul VI, Cardinal Voitilla voted in the papal conclave, which elected Pope John Paul I. John Paul I died after only 33 days as Pope, triggering another conclave. The second conclave of 1978 started on the 14th of October, ten days after the funeral. It was split between two strong candidates for the papacy: Giuseppe Cardinal Siri, the conservative Archbishop of Genoa, and the liberal Archbishop of Florence, Giovanni Cardinal Binelli. A close friend of John Paul I. Supporters of Binelli were confident that he would be elected, and in early ballots, Binelli came within nine votes of success. However, both men faced sufficient opposition for neither to be likely to prevail. Giovanni Colombo, the Archbishop of Milan, was considered as a compromise candidate among the Italian cardinal electors, but when he started to receive votes, he announced that, if elected, he would decline to accept the papacy. France Cardinal Koenig, Archbishop of Vienna, suggested to his fellow electors another compromise candidate, the Polish Cardinal Karol Józef Wojtyla. Wojtyla won on the eighth ballot on the third day coincidentally the day that the American evangelical preacher Billy Graham had just concluded a ten-day pilgrimage to Poland, with, according to the Italian press, 99 votes from the 111 participating electors. Among those cardinals who rallied behind Vytilla were supporters of Giuseppe Siri, Stefan Wyszynski, most of the American cardinals, and other moderate cardinals. He accepted his election with the words, with obedience in faith to Christ, my Lord, and with trust in the Mother of Christ and the Church, in spite of great difficulties, I accept. The Pope, in tribute to his immediate predecessor, then took the regnal name of John Paul II, also in honor of the late Pope, Paul VI, and the traditional white smoke informed the crowd gathered in St. Peter's Square that a Pope had been chosen. There had been rumors that the new Pope wished to be known as Pope Stanislaus in honor of the Polish saint of the name, but was convinced by the cardinals that it was not a Roman name. When the new pontiff appeared on the balcony, he broke tradition by addressing the gathered crowd. Dear brothers and sisters, we are saddened at the death of our beloved Pope John Paul I, and so the cardinals have called for a new Bishop of Rome. They called him from a far away land, far and yet always close because of our communion in faith and Christian traditions. I was afraid to accept that responsibility, yet I do so in a spirit of obedience to the Lord and total faithfulness to Mary, our Most Holy Mother. I am speaking to you in your, no, our Italian language. If I make a mistake, please correct me. Vitilla became the 264th Pope according to the chronological list of popes, the first non-Italian in 455 years. At only 58 years of age, he was the youngest Pope since Pope Pius IX in 1846, who was 54. Like his predecessor, John Paul II dispensed with the traditional papal coronation and instead received ecclesiastical investiture with a simplified papal inauguration on the 22nd of October 1978. During his inauguration, when the cardinals were to kneel before him to take their vows and kiss his ring, he stood up as the Polish prelate Stefan Cardinal Wyszynski knelt down, stopped him from kissing the ring, and simply hugged him. Chapter 5 Section 2 Pastoral Trips during his pontificate, Pope John Paul II made trips to 129 countries, traveling more than 1,100,000 kilometers while doing so. He consistently attracted large crowds, some among the largest ever assembled in human history, such as the Manila World Youth Day, which gathered up to 4 million people, the largest papal gathering ever, according to the Vatican. John Paul II's earliest official visits were to the Dominican Republic and Mexico in January 1979. 
While some of his trips were to places previously visited by Pope Paul VI, John Paul II became the first Pope to visit the White House in October 1979, where he was greeted warmly by then-President Jimmy Carter. He was the first Pope ever to visit several countries in one year, starting in 1979 with Mexico and Ireland. He was the first reigning Pope to travel to the United Kingdom, in 1982, where he met Queen Elizabeth II, the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. While in Britain he also visited Canterbury Cathedral and knelt in prayer with Robert Runcie, the Archbishop of Canterbury, at the spot where Thomas R. Beckett had been killed, as well as holding several large-scale open-air masses, including one at Wembley Stadium, which was attended by some 80,000 people. He travelled to Haiti in 1983, where he spoke in Creole to thousands of impoverished Catholics gathered to greet him at the airport. His message, Things Must Change in Haiti, referring to the disparity between the wealthy and the poor, was met with thunderous applause. In 2000, he was the first modern pope to visit Egypt, where he met with the Coptic Pope, Pope Shenouda III and the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Alexandria. He was the first Catholic Pope to visit and pray in an Islamic mosque, in Damascus, Syria, in 2001. He visited the Umawe Mosque, a former Christian church where John the Baptist is believed to be interred, where he made a speech calling for Muslims, Christians and Jews to live together. On 15 January 1995, during the ex-World Youth Day, he offered Mass to an estimated crowd of between 5 and 7 million in Lanetta Park, Manila, Philippines, which was considered to be the largest single gathering in Christian history. In March 2000, while visiting Jerusalem, John Paul became the first Pope in history to visit and pray at the Western Wall. In September 2001, amid post-11 September concerns, he travelled to Kazakhstan, with an audience largely consisting of Muslims, and to Armenia, to participate in the celebration of 1,700 years of Armenian Christianity. In June 1979, Pope John Paul II traveled to Poland, where ecstatic crowds constantly surrounded him. This first papal trip to Poland uplifted the nation's spirit and sparked the formation of the Solidarity Movement in 1980, which later brought freedom and human rights to his troubled homeland. Poland's communist leaders intended to use the Pope's visit to show the people that although the Pope was Polish it did not alter their capacity to govern, oppress, and distribute the goods of society. They also hoped that if the Pope abided by the rules they set, that the Polish people would see his example and follow them as well. If the Pope's visit inspired a riot, the communist leaders of Poland were prepared to crush the uprising and blame the suffering on the Pope. The Pope won that struggle by transcending politics. His was what Joseph Nye calls soft power, the power of attraction and repulsion. He began with an enormous advantage, and exploited it to the utmost, he headed the one institution that stood for the polar opposite of the communist way of life that the Polish people hated. He was a Pole, but beyond the regime's reach. By identifying with him, Poles would have the chance to cleanse themselves of the compromises they had to make to live under the regime. And so they came to him by the millions. They listened. He told them to be good, not to compromise themselves, to stick by one another, to be fearless, and that God is the only source of goodness, the only standard of conduct. Be not afraid, he said. Millions shouted in response, We want God. We want God. We want God. The regime cowered. Had the Pope chosen to turn his soft power into the hard variety, the regime might have been drowned in blood. Instead, the Pope simply led the Polish people to desert their rulers by affirming solidarity with one another. The Communists managed to hold on as despots a decade longer. But as political leaders, they were finished. Visiting his native Poland in 1979, Pope John Paul II struck what turned out to be a mortal blow to its communist regime, to the Soviet Empire, ultimately to communism. According to John Lewis Gaddis, one of the most influential historians of the Cold War, the trip led to the formation of solidarity, and would begin the process of communism's demise in Eastern Europe. 
When Pope John Paul II kissed the ground at the Warsaw Airport he began the process by which communism in Poland, and ultimately elsewhere in Europe, would come to an end. On later trips to Poland, he gave tacit support to the Solidarity Organization. These visits reinforced this message and contributed to the collapse of East European communism that took place between 1989-1990 with the reintroduction of democracy in Poland, and which then spread through Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe. Chapter 5 Section 3 World Youth Days As an extension of his successful work with youth as a young priest, John Paul II pioneered the International World Youth Days. John Paul II presided over nine of them, Rome, Buenos Aires, Santiago de Compostela, Częstochowa, Denver, Manila, Paris, and Toronto. Total attendance at these signature events of the pontificate was in the tens of millions. Chapter 5 Section 4 Dedicated Years Keenly aware of the rhythms of time and the importance of anniversaries in the Church's life, John Paul II led nine dedicated years during the twenty-six and a half years of his pontificate, the Holy Year of the Redemption in 1983-84, the Marian Year in 1987-88, the Year of the Family in 1993-94, the three Trinitarian years of preparation for the Great Jubilee of 2000, the Great Jubilee itself, the Year of the Rosary in 2003 and the year of the Eucharist, which began on the 17th of October 2004, and concluded six months after the Pope's death. Chapter 5 Section 5, Great Jubilee of 2000 The Great Jubilee of 2000 was a call to the Church to become more aware and to embrace her missionary task for the work of evangelization. From the beginning of my pontificate, my thoughts had been on this holy year 2000 as an important appointment. I thought of its celebration as a providential opportunity during which the Church, 35 years after the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, would examine how far she had renewed herself, in order to be able to take up her evangelizing mission with fresh enthusiasm. John Paul II also made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land for the Great Jubilee of 2000. During his visit to the Holy Land, John Paul II visited many sites of the Rosary, including the following locations, the Wadi al karar at the River Jordan, where it is believed John the Baptist baptized Jesus, one of the luminous mysteries, Manger Square in the Palestinian territories of Bethlehem, near the site of Jesus' birth, one of the joyful mysteries, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the site of Jesus' burial and resurrection, sorrowful and glorious mysteries, respectively. Chapter 5, Teachings As Pope, John Paul II wrote fourteen papal encyclicals and taught about sexuality in what is referred as the theology of the body. Some key elements of his strategy to reposition the Catholic Church were encyclicals such as Ecclesia de Eucharistia, Reconciliatio et Pienitentia and Redemptoris Mater. In his At the Beginning of the New Millennium, he emphasized the importance of starting afresh from Christ, no, we shall not be saved by a formula but by a person. In the splendor of the truth, he emphasized the dependence of man on God and his law and the dependence of freedom on the truth. He warned that man giving himself over to relativism and skepticism, goes off in search of an illusory freedom apart from truth itself. In Fides et Ratio John Paul promoted a renewed interest in philosophy and an autonomous pursuit of truth in theological matters. Drawing on many different sources, he described the mutually supporting relationship between faith and reason, and emphasized that theologians should focus on that relationship. John Paul II wrote extensively about workers and the social doctrine of the Church, which he discussed in three encyclicals, Laborum Exorcens, Solicitudo Re Socialis, and Centesimus Annus. Through his encyclicals and many apostolic letters and exhortations, John Paul II talked about the dignity, and the equality of women. He argued for the importance of the family for the future of humanity. Other encyclicals include the Gospel of Life and At Unum Sint. Though critics accused him of inflexibility in explicitly reasserting Catholic moral teachings against abortion and euthanasia that have been in place for well over a thousand years, he urged a more nuanced view of capital punishment. 
In his second encyclical Dives in Misericordia he stressed that divine mercy is the greatest feature of God, needed especially in modern times. Chapter 6, Section 1, Social and Political Stances John Paul II was considered a conservative on doctrine and issues relating to human sexual reproduction and the ordination of women. While he was visiting the United States in 1977, the year before becoming Pope, Voitila said, All human life, from the moments of conception and through all subsequent stages, is sacred. A series of 129 lectures given by John Paul II during his Wednesday audiences in Rome between September 1979 and November 1984 were later compiled and published as a single work titled Theology of the Body, an extended meditation on human sexuality. He extended it to the condemnation of abortion, euthanasia and virtually all capital punishment, calling them all a part of a struggle between a culture of life and a culture of death. He campaigned for world debt forgiveness and social justice. He coined the term social mortgage, which related that all private property had a social dimension, namely, that the goods of this are originally meant for all. In 2000, he publicly endorsed the Jubilee 2000 campaign on African debt relief fronted by Irish rock stars Bob Geldof and Bono once famously interrupting a U2 recording session by telephoning the studio and asking to speak to Bono. Pope John Paul II, who was present and very influential at the 1962-65 Second Vatican Council, affirmed the teachings of that council and did much to implement them. Nevertheless, his critics often wished that he would embrace the so-called progressive agenda that some hoped would evolve as a result of the council. In fact, the Council did not advocate progressive changes in these areas, for example, they still condemned abortion as an unspeakable crime. Pope John Paul II continued to declare that contraception, abortion, and homosexual acts were gravely sinful, and, with Joseph Ratzinger, opposed liberation theology. Following the Church's exaltation of the marital act of sexual intercourse between a baptized man and woman within sacramental marriage as proper and exclusive to the sacrament of marriage, John Paul II believed that it was, in every instance, profaned by contraception, abortion, divorce followed by a second marriage, and by homosexual acts. In 1994, John Paul II asserted the Church's lack of authority to ordain women to the priesthood, stating that without such authority ordination is not legitimately compatible with fidelity to Christ. This was also deemed a repudiation of calls to break with the constant tradition of the Church by ordaining women to the priesthood. In addition, John Paul II chose not to end the discipline of mandatory priestly celibacy, although in a small number of unusual circumstances, he did allow certain married clergymen of other Christian traditions who later became Catholic to be ordained as Catholic priests. Chapter 6, Section 2, Apartheid in South Africa Pope John Paul II was an outspoken opponent of apartheid in South Africa. In 1985, while visiting the Netherlands, he gave an impassioned speech condemning apartheid at the International Court of Justice, proclaiming that no system of apartheid or separate development will ever be acceptable as a model for the relations between peoples or races. In September 1988, Pope John Paul II made a pilgrimage to ten southern African countries, including those bordering South Africa, while demonstratively avoiding South Africa. During his visit to Zimbabwe, John Paul II called for economic sanctions against South Africa's government. After John Paul II's death, both Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu praised the Pope for defending human rights and condemning economic injustice. Chapter 6 Section 3, Capital Punishment Pope John Paul II was an outspoken opponent of the death penalty, although previous popes had accepted the practice. At a papal mass in St. Louis, Missouri, in the United States he said. A sign of hope is the increasing recognition, that the dignity of human life must never be taken away, even in the case of someone who has done great evil. Modern society has the means of protecting itself, without definitively denying criminals the chance to reform. I renew the appeal I made most recently at Christmas for a consensus to end the death penalty, which is both cruel and unnecessary. 
During that visit, John Paul II convinced the then Governor of Missouri, Mel Carnahan, to reduce the death sentence of convicted murderer Darrell Jamies to life imprisonment without parole. John Paul II's other attempts to reduce the sentence of death row inmates were unsuccessful. In 1983, John Paul II visited Guatemala and unsuccessfully asked the country's president, Efrain Rios Montt, to reduce the sentence for six left-wing guerrillas sentenced to death. In 2002, John Paul II again traveled to Guatemala. At that time, Guatemala was one of only two countries in Latin America to apply capital punishment. John Paul II asked the Guatemalan president, Alfonso Portillo, for a moratorium on executions. Chapter 6, Section 4, European Union Pope John Paul II pushed for a reference to Europe's Christian cultural roots in the draft of the European Constitution. In his 2003 Apostolic Exhortation Ecclesia in Europa, John Paul II wrote that he fully the secular nature of institutions. However, he wanted the EU Constitution to enshrine religious rights, including acknowledging the rights of religious groups to organize freely, recognize the specific identity of each denomination and allow for a structured dialogue between each religious community and the EU, and extend across the European Union the legal status enjoyed by religious institutions in individual member states. I wish once more to appeal to those drawing up the future European Constitutional Treaty so that it will include a reference to the religion and in particular to the Christian heritage of Europe, John Paul II said. The Pope's desire for a reference to Europe's Christian identity in the Constitution was supported by non-Catholic representatives of the Church of England, and Eastern Orthodox churches from Russia, Romania, and Greece. John Paul II's demand to include a reference to Europe's Christian roots in the European Constitution was supported by some non-Christians, such as Joseph Weiler, a practicing Orthodox Jew and renowned constitutional lawyer, who said that the Constitution's lack of a reference to Christianity was not a demonstration of neutrality, but, rather, a Jacobin attitude. At the same time, however, John Paul II was an enthusiastic supporter of European integration, in particular, he supported his native Poland's entry into the bloc. On 19 May 2003, three weeks before a referendum was held in Poland on EU membership, the Polish Pope addressed his compatriots and urged them to vote for Poland's EU membership at St. Peter's Square in Vatican City State. While some conservative, Catholic politicians in Poland opposed EU membership, John Paul II said. I know that there are many in opposition to integration. I appreciate their concern about maintaining the cultural and religious identity of our nation. However, I must emphasize that Poland has always been an important part of Europe. Europe needs Poland. The Church in Europe needs the Poles' testimony of faith. Poland needs Europe. The Polish Pope compared Poland's entry into the EU to the Union of Lublin, which was signed in 1569 and united the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania into one nation and created an elective monarchy. Chapter 6, Section 5, Evolution On the 22nd of October 1996, in a speech to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences plenary session at the Vatican, John Paul II said of evolution that this theory has been progressively accepted by researchers, following a series of discoveries in various fields of knowledge. The convergence, neither sought nor fabricated, of the results of work that was conducted independently is in itself a significant argument in favor of this theory. John Paul II's embrace of evolution was enthusiastically praised by American paleontologist and evolutionary biologist Stephen J. Gould, with whom he had an audience in 1984. Although generally accepting the theory of evolution, John Paul II made one major exception, the human soul. If the human body has its origin in living material which pre-exists it, the spiritual soul is immediately created by God. Chapter 6, Section 6, Iraq War In 2003 John Paul II criticized the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq, saying in his State of the World Address No to War. War is not always inevitable. 
it is always a defeat for humanity. He sent Pio Cardinal Laghi, the former apostolic pronuncio to the United States, to talk with George W. Bush, the U.S. president, to express opposition to the war. John Paul II said that it was up to the United Nations to solve the international conflict through diplomacy and that a unilateral aggression is a crime against peace and a violation of international law. The Pope's opposition to the Iraq War led to him being a candidate to win the 2003 Nobel Peace Prize, which was ultimately awarded to Iranian attorney-slash-judge and noted human rights advocate, Shirin Ibadi. Chapter 6 Section 7 – Liberation Theology in 1984 and 1986, through Cardinal Ratzinger as Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, John Paul II officially condemned aspects of liberation theology, which had many followers in Latin America. Visiting Europe, Salvadoran Archbishop Oscar Romero unsuccessfully attempted to obtain a Vatican condemnation of the right wing El Salvador's regime for violations of human rights during the Salvadoran Civil War and its support of death squads and expressed his frustration in working with clergy who cooperated with the government. He was encouraged by John Paul II to maintain episcopal unity as a top priority. In his travel to Managua, Nicaragua, in 1983, John Paul II harshly condemned what he dubbed the Popular Church, and the Nicaraguan clergy's tendencies to support the leftist Sandinistas, reminding the clergy of their duties of obedience to the Holy See. During that visit Ernesto Cardinal, a priest and minister in the Sandinista government, knelt to kiss his hand. John Paul withdrew it, wagged his finger in Cardinal's face, and told him, you must straighten out your position with the Church. Chapter 6, Section 8, Organized Crime John Paul II was the first pontiff to denounce mafia violence in southern Italy. In 1993, during a pilgrimage to Agrigento, Sicily, he appealed to the mafiosi, I say to those responsible, convert. One day, the judgment of God will arrive. In 1994, John Paul II visited Catania and told victims of mafia violence to rise up and cloak yourself in light and justice. In 1995, the mafia bombed two historical churches in Rome. Some believed that this was the mob's vendetta against the Pope for his denunciations of organized crime. Chapter 6, Section 9, Persian Gulf War Between 1990 and 1991, a 34-nation coalition led by the United States waged a war against Saddam Hussein's Iraq, which had invaded and annexed Kuwait. Pope John Paul II was a staunch opponent of the Gulf War. Throughout the conflict, he appealed to the international community to stop the war, and after it was over led diplomatic initiatives to negotiate peace in the Middle East. In his 1991 encyclical Centesimus Annus, John Paul II harshly condemned the conflict. No, never again war, which destroys the lives of innocent people, teaches how to kill, throws into upheaval even the lives of those who do the killing and leaves behind a trail of resentment and hatred thus making it all the more difficult to find a just solution of the very problems which provoked the war. In April 1991, during his Ubi et Orbi Sunday message at St. Peter's Basilica, John Paul II called for the international community to lend an ear to the long-ignored aspirations of oppressed peoples. He specifically named the Kurds, a people who were fighting a civil war against Saddam Hussein's troops in Iraq, as one such people, and referred to the war as a darkness menacing the earth. During this time, the Vatican had expressed its frustration with the international ignoring of the Pope's calls for peace in the Middle East. Chapter 6, Section 10, Rwandan Genocide John Paul II was the first world leader to describe as genocide the massacre by Hutus of Tutsis in the mostly Catholic country of Rwanda, which started in 1990 and reached its height in 1994. He called for a ceasefire and condemned the massacres on the 10th of April and the 15th of May 1990. In 1995, during his third visit to Kenya before an audience of 300,000, John Paul II pleaded for an end to the violence in Rwanda and Burundi, pleading for forgiveness and reconciliation as a solution to the genocide. He told Rwandan and Burundian refugees, 
that he was close to them and shared their immense pain. He said, What is happening in your countries is a terrible tragedy that must end. During the African Synod, we, the pastors of the Church, felt the duty to express our consternation and to launch an appeal for forgiveness and reconciliation. This is the only way to dissipate the threats of ethnocentrism that are hovering over Africa these days and that have so brutally touched Rwanda, and Burundi. Chapter 6, Section 11, Views on Sexuality While taking a traditional position on human sexuality, maintaining the Church's moral opposition to homosexual acts, John Paul II asserted that people with homosexual inclinations possess the same inherent dignity and rights as everybody else. In his book Memory and Identity he referred to the strong pressures by the European Parliament to recognize homosexual unions as an alternative type of family, with the right to adopt children. In the book, as quoted by Reuters, he wrote, it is legitimate and necessary to ask oneself if this is not perhaps part of a new ideology of evil, more subtle and hidden, perhaps, intent upon exploiting human rights themselves against man and against the family. A 1997 study determined that 3% of the Pope's statements were about the issue of sexual morality. In 1986, the Pope approved the release of a document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith regarding letter to the bishops of the Catholic Church on the pastoral care of homosexual persons. While not neglecting to comment on homosexuality and moral order, the letter issued multiple affirmations of the dignity of homosexual persons. Chapter 6, Reform of Canon Law John Paul II completed a full-scale reform of the Catholic Church's legal system, Latin and Eastern, and a reform of the Roman Curia. On 18 October 1990, when promulgating the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches, John Paul II stated. By the publication of this code, the canonical ordering of the whole Church is thus at length completed, following as it does, the Apostolic Constitution on the Roman Curia of 1988, which is added to both codes as the primary instrument of the Roman Pontiff for the communion that binds together, as it were, the whole Church. In 1998 Pope John Paul II issued the motu proprio ad quendam fidem, which amended two canons of the 1983 Code of Canon Law and two canons of the 1990 Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches. Chapter 7 Section 1, 1983 Code of Canon Law On 25 January 1983, with the Apostolic Constitution Sacra Disciplini Leges John Paul II promulgated the current Code of Canon Law for all members of the Catholic Church who belonged to the Latin Church. It entered into force the first Sunday of the following Advent, which was the 27th of November 1983. John Paul II described the new code as the last document of Vatican II. Edward N. Peters has referred to the 1983 code as the Johanno Pauline Code, paralleling the Pio Benedictine 1917 code that it replaced. Chapter 7 Section 2, Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches Pope John Paul II promulgated the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches on 18 October 1990, by the document Sacri Canyones. The Xio came into force of law on 1 October 1991. It is the codification of the common portions of the canon law for the 23 of the 24 sui juris churches in the Catholic Church that are the Eastern Catholic Churches. It is divided into 30 titles and has a total of 1,540 canons. Chapter 7 Section 3, Pastor Bonus John Paul II promulgated the Apostolic Constitution Pastor Bonus on 28 June 1988. It instituted a number of reforms in the process of running the Roman Curia. Pastor Bonus laid out in considerable detail the organization of the Roman Curia, specifying precisely the names and composition of each dicastery, and enumerating the competencies of each dicastery. It replaced the previous special law, Regimini Ecclesi Universe, which was promulgated by Paul VI in 1967. Chapter 7, Catechism of the Catholic Church On the 11th of October 1992, in his Apostolic Constitution Fidei Depositum, 
John Paul ordered the publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. He declared the publication to be a sure norm for teaching the faith, a sure and authentic reference text for teaching Catholic doctrine, and particularly for preparing local catechisms. It was meant to encourage and assist in the writing of new local catechisms rather than replacing them. Chapter 8 Role in the Collapse of Dictatorships Pope John Paul II has been credited with inspiring political change that not only led to the collapse of communism in his native Poland, and eventually all of Eastern Europe, but also in many countries ruled by dictators. In the words of Joaquin Navarro Valls, John Paul II's press secretary. The single fact of John Paul II's election in 1978 changed everything. In Poland, everything began not in East Germany or Czechoslovakia. Then the whole thing spread. Why in 1980 did they lead the way in Gdansk? Why did they decide, now or never? Only because there was a Polish Pope. He was in Chile and Pinochet was out. He was in Haiti, and Duvalier was out. He was in the Philippines and Marcos was out. On many of those occasions, people would come here to the Vatican thanking the Holy Father for changing things. Chapter 9 Section 1, Chile Before John Paul II's pilgrimage to Latin America, during a meeting with reporters, he criticized Augusto Pinochet's regime as dictatorial. In the words of the New York Times, he used unusually strong language to criticize Pinochet and asserted to journalists that the Church in Chile must not only pray, but actively fight for the restoration of democracy in Chile. During his visit to Chile in 1987, John Paul II asked Chile's 31 Catholic bishops to campaign for free elections in the country. According to George Weigel and Cardinal Stanislav Giewisch, he encouraged Pinochet to accept a democratic opening of the regime, and may even have called for his resignation. According to Monsignor Slavomir Oda, the postulator of John Paul II's beatification cause, John Paul's words to Pinochet had a profound impact on the Chilean dictator. The Pope confided to a friend, I received a letter from Pinochet, in which he told me that as a Catholic he had listened to my words, he had accepted them, and he had decided to begin the process to change the leadership of his country. During his visit to Chile, John Paul II supported the Vicariate of Solidarity, the church-led pro-democracy, anti-Pinochet organization. John Paul II visited the Vicariate of Solidarity's offices, spoke with its workers, and called upon them to continue their work, emphasizing that the gospel consistently urges respect for human rights. While in Chile, Pope John Paul II made gestures of public support of Chile's anti-Pinochet democratic opposition. For instance, he hugged and kissed Carmen Gloria Quintana, a young student who had been nearly burned to death by Chilean police and told her that we must pray for peace and justice in Chile. Later, he met with several opposition groups, including those that had been declared illegal by Pinochet's government. The opposition praised John Paul II for denouncing Pinochet as a dictator, for many members of Chile's opposition were persecuted for much milder statements. Bishop Carlos Camus, one of the harshest critics of Pinochet's dictatorship within the Chilean church, praised John Paul II's stance during the papal visit, I am quite moved, because our pastor supports us totally. Never again will anyone be able to say that we are interfering in politics when we defend human dignity. He added, no country the Pope has visited has remained the same after his departure. The Pope's visit is a mission, an extraordinary social catechism, and his stay here will be a watershed in Chilean history. Some have erroneously accused John Paul II of affirming Pinochet's regime by appearing with the Chilean ruler in public. However, Cardinal Roberto Tucci, the organizer of John Paul II's visits, revealed that Pinochet tricked the pontiff by telling him he would take him to his living room, while in reality he took him to his balcony. Tucci says that the pontiff was furious. Chapter 9 Section 2, Haiti Pope John Paul II visited Haiti on 9 March 1983, when the country was ruled by Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier. 
he bluntly criticized the poverty of the country, directly addressing Baby Doc and his wife, Michelle Bennett in front of a large crowd of Haitians. Yours is a beautiful country, rich in human resources, but Christians cannot be unaware of the injustice, the excessive inequality, the degradation of the quality of life, the misery, the hunger, the fear suffered by the majority of the people. John Paul II spoke in French and occasionally in Creole, and in the homily outlined the basic human rights that most Haitians lack, the opportunity to eat enough, to be cared for when ill, to find housing, to study, to overcome illiteracy, to find worthwhile and properly paid work, all that provides a truly human life for men and women, for young and old. Following John Paul II's pilgrimage, the Haitian opposition to Duvalier frequently reproduced and quoted the Pope's message. Shortly before leaving Haiti, John Paul II called for social change in Haiti by saying, Lift up your heads, be conscious of your dignity of men created in God's image. John Paul II's visit inspired massive protests against the Duvalier dictatorship. In response to the visit, 860 Catholic priests and church workers signed a statement committing the church to work on behalf of the poor. In 1986, Duvalier was deposed in an uprising. Chapter 9 Section 3, Paraguay The collapse of the dictatorship of General Alfredo Stroessner of Paraguay was linked, among other things, to Pope John Paul II's visit to the South American country in May 1988. Since Stroessner's taking power through a coup d'état in 1954, Paraguay's bishops increasingly criticized the regime for human rights abuses, rigged elections, and the country's feudal economy. During his private meeting with Stroessner, John Paul II told the dictator, Politics has a fundamental ethical dimension because it is first and foremost a service to man. The Church can and must remind men, and in particular those who govern, of their ethical duties for the good of the whole of society. The Church cannot be isolated inside its temples just as men's consciences cannot be isolated from God. Later, during a Mass, Pope John Paul II criticized the regime for impoverishing the peasants and the unemployed, saying that the government must give people greater access to the land. Although Stroessner tried to prevent him from doing so, Pope John Paul II met opposition leaders in the one-party state. Chapter 9, Role in the Fall of Communism Chapter 10 Section 1, Role as Spiritual Inspiration and Catalyst By the late 1970s the dissolution of the Soviet Union had been predicted by some observers. John Paul II has been credited with being instrumental in bringing down communism in Central and Eastern Europe, by being the spiritual inspiration behind its downfall and catalyst for a peaceful revolution in Poland. Lech Walesa, the founder of Solidarity and the first post-communist president of Poland, credited John Paul II with giving Poles the courage to demand change. According to Walesa, before his pontificate, the world was divided into blocks. Nobody knew how to get rid of communism. In Warsaw, in 1979, he simply said, do not be afraid, and later prayed, let your spirit descend and change the image of the land, this land. It has also been widely alleged that the Vatican Bank covertly funded solidarity. In 1984 President Ronald Reagan opened diplomatic relations with the Vatican for the first time since 1870. In sharp contrast to the long history of strong domestic opposition, this time there was very little opposition from Congress, the courts, and Protestant groups. Relations between Reagan and John Paul II were close especially because of their shared anti-communism and keen interest in forcing the Soviets out of Poland. Reagan's correspondence with the Pope reveals a continuous scurrying to shore up Vatican support for U.S. policies. Perhaps most surprisingly, the papers show that, as late as 1984, the Pope did not believe the communist Polish government could be changed. The British historian Timothy Garton Ash, who describes himself as an agnostic liberal, said shortly after John Paul II's death, no one can prove conclusively that he was a primary cause of the end of communism. However, the major figures on all sides, 
not just Lech Walesa, the Polish solidarity leader, but also Solidarity's arch opponent, General Wojciech Jaruzelski, not just the former American President George Bush Sr. but also the former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, now agree that he was. I would argue the historical case in three steps, without the Polish Pope, no Solidarity Revolution in Poland in 1980, without Solidarity, no dramatic change in Soviet policy towards Eastern Europe under Gorbachev, without that change, no Velvet Revolutions in 1989. In December 1989, John Paul II met with the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev at the Vatican and each expressed his respect and admiration for the other. Gorbachev once said the collapse of the Iron Curtain would have been impossible without John Paul II. On John Paul II's death, Mikhail Gorbachev said, Pope John Paul II's devotion to his followers is a remarkable example to all of us. On 4 June 2004 U.S. President George W. Bush presented the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States' highest civilian honor, to John Paul II during a ceremony at the Apostolic Palace. The President read the citation that accompanied the medal, which recognized this son of Poland whose principles stand for peace and freedom, has inspired millions and helped to topple communism, and tyranny. After receiving the award, John Paul II said, May the desire for freedom, peace, a more humane world symbolized by this medal inspire men, and women of goodwill in every time and place. Chapter 10 Section 2 Communist Attempt to Humiliate John Paul II In 1983 Poland's communist government unsuccessfully tried to humiliate John Paul II by falsely saying he had fathered an illegitimate child. Section D of Slutsbe Bezbeestsenstwa, the security service, had an action named Triangolo to carry out criminal operations against the Catholic Church, the operation encompassed all Polish hostile actions against the Pope. Captain Grzegorz Piotrowski, one of the murderers of beatified Jersey Pope Ielusko, was the leader of Section D. They drugged Irina Kinesevska, the secretary of the Krakow-based weekly Catholic magazine Tygodnik Pauseczny where Karol Wojtyla had worked, and unsuccessfully attempted to make her admit to having had sexual relations with him. The SB then attempted to compromise Krakow priest Andrzej Bardecki, an editor of Tygodnik Pauseczny and one of the closest friends of Cardinal Karol Wojtyla before he became Pope, by planting false memoirs in his dwelling, but Piotrowski was exposed and the forgeries were found and destroyed before the SB could discover them. Chapter 10 Relations with Other Denominations and Religions John Paul II traveled extensively and met with believers, from many divergent faiths. At the World Day of Prayer for Peace, held in Assisi on 27 October 1986, more than 120 representatives of different religions and denominations spent a day of fasting and prayer. Chapter 11 Section 1 Anglicanism John Paul II had good relations with the Church of England. He was the first reigning Pope to travel to the United Kingdom, in 1982, where he met Queen Elizabeth II, the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. He preached in Canterbury Cathedral and received Robert Runcie, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He said that he was disappointed by the Church of England's decision to ordain women, and saw it as a step away from unity between the Anglican Communion and the Catholic Church. In 1980, John Paul II issued a pastoral provision allowing married former Episcopal priests to become Catholic priests, and for the acceptance of former Episcopal Church parishes into the Catholic Church. He allowed the creation of the Anglican use form of the Latin Rite, which incorporates the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. He helped establish Our Lady of the Atonement Catholic Church, together with Archbishop Patrick Flores of San Antonio, Texas, as the inaugural parish for the Anglican use liturgy. Chapter 11 Section 2 – Animism In his book-length interview Crossing the Threshold of Hope with the Italian journalist Vittorio Massori published in 1995, John Paul II draws parallels between animism and Christianity. He says, It would be helpful to recall, the animist religions which stress ancestor worship. It seems that those who practice them are particularly close to Christianity, and among them, 
the Church's missionaries also find it easier to speak a common language. Is there, perhaps, in this veneration of ancestors a kind of preparation for the Christian faith in the communion of saints, in which all believers, whether living or dead, form a single community, a single body? There is nothing strange, then, that the African and Asian animists would become believers in Christ more easily than followers of the great religions of the Far East. In 1985, the Pope visited the African country of Togo, where 60% of the population espouses animist beliefs. To honor the Pope, animist religious leaders met him at a Catholic Marian shrine in the forest, much to the pontiff's delight. John Paul II proceeded to call for the need for religious tolerance, praised nature, and emphasized common elements between animism and Christianity, saying, Nature, exuberant and splendid in this area of forests and lakes, impregnates spirits and hearts with its mystery and orients them spontaneously toward the mystery of he who is the author of life. It is this religious sentiment that animates you and one can say that animates all of your compatriots. During the investiture of President Thomas Boney Yui of Benin as a titled Yoruba chieftain on 20 December 2008, the reigning Uni of E-Life, Nigeria, Olubus II, referred to Pope John Paul II as a previous recipient of the same royal honor. Chapter 11 Section 3 Armenian Apostolic Church John Paul II had good relations with the Armenian Apostolic Church. In 1996, he brought the Catholic Church and the Armenian Church closer by agreeing with Armenian Archbishop Karakin II on Christ's nature. During an audience in 2000, John Paul II and Karakin II, by then the Catholicos of all Armenians, issued a joint statement condemning the Armenian genocide. Meanwhile, the Pope gave Karakin the relics of Saint Gregory the Illuminator, the first head of the Armenian Church that had been kept in Naples, Italy, for 500 years. In September 2001, John Paul II went on a three-day pilgrimage to Armenia to take part in an ecumenical celebration with Karakin II in the newly consecrated Saint Gregory the Illuminator Cathedral in Yerevan. The two church leaders signed a declaration remembering the victims of the Armenian Genocide. Chapter 11 Section 4, Buddhism Tenzin Gyasto, the 14th Dalai Lama, visited John Paul II eight times. The two men held many similar views and understood similar plights, both coming from nations affected by communism and both serving as heads of major religious bodies. As Archbishop of Krakow, long before the 14th Dalai Lama was a world-famous figure, Vaitila held special masses to pray for the Tibetan people's non-violent struggle for freedom from Maoist China. During his 1995 visit to Sri Lanka, a country where a majority of the population adheres to Theravada Buddhism, John Paul II expressed his admiration for Buddhism. In particular I express my highest regard for the followers of Buddhism, the majority religion in Sri Lanka, with its, four great values of, loving-kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity, with its ten transcendental virtues and the joys of the Sangha expressed so beautifully in the Theragathas. I ardently hope that my visit will serve to strengthen the goodwill between us, and that it will reassure every one of the Catholic Church's desire for interreligious dialogue and cooperation in building a more just and fraternal world. To everyone I extend the hand of friendship, recalling the splendid words of the Dharmapada, better than a thousand useless words is one single word that gives peace. Chapter 11 Section 5, Eastern Orthodox Church In May 1999, John Paul II visited Romania on the invitation from Patriarch Teoctist Tarapasu of the Romanian Orthodox Church. This was the first time a pope had visited a predominantly Eastern Orthodox country since the Great Schism in 1054. On his arrival, the Patriarch and the President of Romania, Emil Constantinescu, greeted the Pope. The Patriarch stated, the second millennium of Christian history began with a painful wounding of the unity of the Church, the end of this millennium, has seen a real commitment to restoring Christian unity. On 23-27 June 2001, 
John Paul II visited Ukraine, another heavily Orthodox nation, at the invitation of the President of Ukraine and bishops of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. The Pope spoke to leaders of the All-Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations, pleading for open, tolerant and honest dialogue. About 200,000 people attended the liturgies celebrated by the Pope in Kiev, and the liturgy in Lviv gathered nearly one and a half million faithful. John Paul II said that an end to the Great Schism was one of his fondest wishes. Healing divisions between the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches regarding Latin and Byzantine traditions was clearly of great personal interest. For many years, John Paul II sought to facilitate dialogue and unity stating as early as 1988 in in Mundium, Europe has two lungs, it will never breathe easily until it uses both of them. During his 2001 travels, John Paul II became the first Pope to visit Greece in 1291 years. In Athens, the Pope met with Archbishop Christodoulos, the head of the Church of Greece. After a private 30-minute meeting, the two spoke publicly. Christodoulos read a list of 13 offenses of the Catholic Church against the Eastern Orthodox Church since the Great Schism, including the pillaging of Constantinople by Crusaders in 1204, and bemoaned the lack of apology from the Catholic Church, saying until now, there has not been heard a single request for pardon for the maniacal Crusaders of the 13th century. The Pope responded by saying for the occasions past and present, when sons and daughters of the Catholic Church have sinned by action or omission against their Orthodox brothers and sisters, may the Lord grant us forgiveness, to which Christodoulos immediately applauded. John Paul II said that the sacking of Constantinople was a source of profound regret for Catholics. Later John Paul II and Christodoulos met on a spot where St. Paul had once preached to Athenian Christians. They issued a common declaration, saying we shall do everything in our power, so that the Christian roots of Europe and its Christian soul may be preserved. We condemn all recourse to violence, proselytism and fanaticism, in the name of religion. The two leaders then said the Lord's Prayer together, breaking an orthodox taboo against praying with Catholics. The Pope had said throughout his pontificate that one of his greatest dreams was to visit Russia, but this never occurred. He attempted to solve the problems that had arisen over centuries between the Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches, and in 2004 gave them a 1730 copy of the lost icon of Our Lady of Kazan. Chapter 11 Section 6 Islam John Paul II made considerable efforts to improve relations between Catholicism and Islam. On 6 May 2001, he became the first Catholic Pope to enter and pray in a mosque, namely the Yumaway Mosque in Damascus, Syria. Respectfully removing his shoes, he entered the former Byzantine-era Christian church dedicated to John the Baptist, who is also revered as a prophet of Islam. He gave a speech including the statement, For all the times that Muslims and Christians have offended one another, we need to seek forgiveness from the Almighty and to offer each other forgiveness. He kissed the Quran in Syria, an act that made him popular among Muslims but that disturbed many Catholics. In 2004, John Paul II hosted the Papal Concert of Reconciliation, which brought together leaders of Islam with leaders of the Jewish community and of the Catholic Church at the Vatican for a concert by the Krakow Philharmonic Choir from Poland, the London Philharmonic Choir from the United Kingdom, the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra from the United States and the Ankara State Polyphonic Choir of Turkey. The event was conceived and conducted by Sir Gilbert Levine, KCSG and was broadcast throughout the world. John Paul II oversaw the publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which makes a special provision for Muslims, therein, it is written, together with us they adore the one, merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. Chapter 11 Section 7, Jainism in 1995, Pope John Paul II held a meeting with 21 Jains, organized by the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. He praised Mohandas Gandhi for his unshakable faith in God, assured the Jains that the Catholic Church will continue to engage in dialogue with their religion and spoke of the common need to aid the poor. The Jain leaders were impressed with the Pope's transparency and simplicity, 
and the meeting received much attention in the Gujarat state in western India, home to many Jains. Chapter 11 Section 8, Judaism Relations between Catholicism and Judaism improved, dramatically during the pontificate of John Paul II. He spoke frequently about the Church's relationship with the Jewish faith. In 1979, John Paul II visited the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland, where many of his compatriots had perished during the German occupation there in World War II, the first pope to do so. In 1998, he issued We Remember, a reflection on the Shoah, which outlined his thinking on the Holocaust. He became the first pope known to have made an official papal visit to a synagogue, when he visited the Great Synagogue of Rome on 13 April 1986. On 30 December 1993, Jean Paul II established formal diplomatic relations between the Holy See and the State of Israel, acknowledging its centrality in Jewish life and faith. On 7 April 1994, he hosted the Papal Concert to commemorate the Holocaust. It was the first ever Vatican event dedicated to the memory of the six million Jews murdered in World War II. This concert, which was conceived and conducted by U.S. conductor Gilbert Levine, was attended by the chief rabbi of Rome Elio Toff, the president of Italy Oscar Luigi Scalfaro, and survivors of the Holocaust from around the world. The Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, actor Richard Dreyfus and cellist Lynn Harrell performed on this occasion under Levine's direction. On the morning of the concert, the Pope received the attending members of survivor community in a special audience in the Apostolic Palace. In March 2000, John Paul II visited Yad Vashem, the National Holocaust Memorial in Israel, and later made history by touching one of the holiest sites in Judaism, the Western Wall in Jerusalem, placing a letter inside it. In part of his address he said, I assure the Jewish people the Catholic Church, is deeply saddened by the hatred, acts of persecution and displays of anti-Semitism directed against the Jews by Christians at any time and in any place, and he added that there were no words strong enough to deplore the terrible tragedy of the Holocaust. Israeli Cabinet Minister Rabbi Michael Melchior, who hosted the Pope's visit, said he was very moved by the Pope's gesture. It was beyond history, beyond memory. We are deeply saddened by the behavior of those who in the course of history have caused these children of yours to suffer, and asking your forgiveness we wish to commit ourselves to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant. In October 2003, the Anti-Defamation League issued a statement congratulating John Paul II on entering the 25th year of his papacy. In January 2005, John Paul II became the first pope known to receive a priestly blessing from a rabbi, when Rabbis Benjamin Blesch, Barry Dov Schwartz, and Jack Bimporad visited the pontiff at Clementine Hall in the Apostolic Palace. Immediately after John Paul II's death, the ADL said in a statement that he had revolutionized Catholic Jewish relations, saying, More change for the better took place in his 27 year papacy than in the nearly 2,000 years before. In another statement issued by the Australia-Israel and Jewish Affairs Council, Director Dr. Colin Rubenstein said, The Pope will be remembered for his inspiring spiritual leadership in the cause of freedom and humanity. He achieved far more in terms of transforming relations with both the Jewish people and the State of Israel than any other figure in the history of the Catholic Church. With Judaism, therefore, we have a relationship which we do not have with any other religion. You are our dearly beloved brothers, and in a certain way, it could be said that you are our elder brothers. In an interview with the Polish press agency, Michael Shudrick, chief rabbi of Poland, said that never in history did anyone do as much for Christian-Jewish dialogue as Pope John Paul II, adding that many Jews had a greater respect for the late Pope than for some rabbis. Shudrick praised John Paul II for condemning antisemitism as a sin, which no previous pope had done. On John Paul II's beatification, the chief rabbi of Rome, Riccardo di Seni, said in an interview with the Vatican newspaper Le Servitore Romano that John Paul II was revolutionary because he tore down a thousand year wall of Catholic distrust of the Jewish world. Meanwhile, Elio Toff, the former chief rabbi of Rome, said that. 
Remembrance of the Pope Karl Vitilla will remain strong in the collective Jewish memory because of his appeals to fraternity and the spirit of tolerance, which excludes all violence. In the stormy history of relations between Roman popes and Jews in the ghetto in which they were closed for over three centuries in humiliating circumstances, John Paul II is a bright figure in his uniqueness. In relations between our two great religions in the new century that was stained with bloody wars and the plague of racism, the heritage of John Paul II remains one of the few spiritual islands guaranteeing survival and human progress. Chapter 11 Section 9 Lutheranism. From 15 to the 19th of November 1980, John Paul II visited West Germany on his first trip to a country with a large Lutheran Protestant population. In Mainz, he met with leaders of the Evangelical Church in Germany, and with representatives of other Christian denominations. On the 11th of December 1983, John Paul II participated in an ecumenical service in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Rome, the first papal visit ever to a Lutheran church. The visit took place 500 years after the birth of Martin Luther, German Augustinian monk and Protestant reformer. In his apostolic pilgrimage to Norway, Iceland, Finland, Denmark and Sweden of June 1989, John Paul II became the first Pope to visit countries with Lutheran majorities. In addition to celebrating Mass with Catholic believers, he participated in ecumenical services at places that had been Catholic shrines before the Reformation, Nidaros Cathedral in Norway, near St. Olav's Church at Thingvella in Iceland, Toku Cathedral in Finland, Roskilla Cathedral in Denmark, and Uppsala Cathedral in Sweden. On 31 October 1999, representatives of the Vatican and the Lutheran World Federation signed a joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, as a gesture of unity. The signing was a fruit of a theological dialogue that had been going on between the LWF and the Vatican since 1965. Chapter 11, Assassination Attempts and Plots As he entered St. Peter's Square to address an audience on 13 May 1981, Pope John Paul II was shot and critically wounded by Mehmet Ali Arja, an expert Turkish gunman who was a member of the militant fascist group Grey Wolves. The assassin used a Browning 9mm semi-automatic pistol, shooting the Pope in the abdomen and perforating his colon and small intestine multiple times. John Paul II was rushed into the Vatican complex and then to the Gemelli Hospital. On the way to the hospital, he lost consciousness. Even though the two bullets missed his mesenteric artery and abdominal aorta, he lost nearly three quarters of his blood. He underwent five hours of surgery to treat his wounds. Surgeons performed a colostomy, temporarily rerouting the upper part of the large intestine to let the damaged lower part heal. When he briefly regained consciousness before being operated on, he instructed the doctors not to remove his brown scapula during the operation. One of the few people allowed in to see him at the Gemelli Clinic was one of his closest friends philosopher Anna Teresa Timinyeka, who arrived on Saturday 16 May and kept him company while he recovered from emergency surgery. The Pope later stated that the Blessed Virgin Mary helped keep him alive throughout his ordeal. Could I forget that the event in St. Peter's Square took place on the day and at the hour when the first appearance of the Mother of Christ, to the poor little peasants has been remembered for over sixty years at Fatima, Portugal. For in everything that happened to me on that very day, I felt that extraordinary motherly protection and care, which turned out to be stronger than the deadly bullet. Arja was caught and restrained by a nun and other bystanders until police arrived. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. Two days after Christmas in 1983, John Paul II visited Arja in prison. John Paul II and Arja spoke, privately for about 20 minutes. John Paul II said, what we talked about will have to remain a secret between him and me. I spoke to him as a brother whom I have pardoned and who has my complete trust. Numerous other theories were advanced to explain the assassination attempt, some of them controversial. One such theory, advanced by Michael Ledeen and heavily pushed by the United States Central Intelligence Agency at the time of the assassination, 
but never substantiated by evidence, was that the Soviet Union was behind the attempt on John Paul II's life in retaliation for the Pope's support of Solidarity, the Catholic, pro-democratic Polish workers' movement. This theory was supported by the 2006 Mitrokin Commission, set up by Silvio Berlusconi and headed by Forza Italia Senator Paolo Guzanti, which alleged that communist Bulgarian security departments were utilized to prevent the Soviet Union's role from being uncovered, and concluded that Soviet military intelligence, not the KGB, were responsible. Russian Foreign Intelligence Service spokesman Boris Labasov called the accusation absurd. The Pope declared during a May 2002 visit to Bulgaria that the country's Soviet bloc-era leadership had nothing to do with the assassination attempt. However, his secretary, Cardinal Stanislav Jewish, alleged in his book A Life with Karl, that the Pope was convinced privately that the former Soviet Union was behind the attack. It was later discovered that many of John Paul II's aides had foreign government attachments, Bulgaria and Russia disputed the Italian Commission's conclusions, pointing out that the Pope had publicly denied the Bulgarian connection. A second assassination attempt was made on 12 May 1982, just a day before the anniversary of the first attempt on his life, in Fatima, Portugal when a man tried to stab John Paul II with a bayonet. He was sopped by security guards. Stanislav Jewish later said that John Paul II had been injured during the attempt but managed to hide a non-life-threatening wound. The assailant, a traditionalist Catholic Spanish priest named Juan Maria Fernandez y Cron, had been ordained as a priest by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre of the Society of St. Pius X and was opposed to the changes made by the Second Vatican Council, saying that the Pope was an agent of Communist Moscow and of the Marxist Eastern Bloc. Fernandez Y. Crone subsequently left the priesthood and served three years of a six-year sentence. The ex-priest was treated for mental illness and then expelled from Portugal to become a solicitor in Belgium. The Al-Qaeda-funded Bojinka plot planned to kill John Paul II during a visit to the Philippines during World Youth Day 1995 celebrations. On 15 January 1995 a suicide bomber was planning to dress as a priest and detonate a bomb when the Pope passed in his motorcade on his way to the San Carlos Seminary in Makati City. The assassination was supposed to divert attention from the next phase of the operation. However, a chemical fire inadvertently started by the cell alerted police to their whereabouts, and all were arrested a week before the Pope's visit and confessed to the plot. In 2009 John Kula, a journalist and former army intelligence officer, published Spies in the Vatican, the Soviet Union's Cold War against the Catholic Church. Mining mostly East German and Polish secret police archives, Kula says the assassination attempts were KGB-backed and gives details. During John Paul II's papacy there were many clerics within the Vatican who on nomination, declined to be ordained, and then mysteriously left the church. There is wide speculation that they were, in reality, KGB agents. Chapter 12, Apologies John Paul II apologized to many groups that had suffered at the hands of the Catholic Church through the years. Before becoming Pope he had been a prominent editor and supporter of initiatives, such as the Letter of Reconciliation of the Polish Bishops to the German Bishops from 1965. As Pope, he officially made public apologies for over 100 wrongdoings, including the legal process on the Italian scientist and philosopher Galileo Galilei, himself a devout Catholic, around 1633. Catholics' involvement with the African chiefs who sold their subjects and captives in the African slave trade. The church hierarchy's role in burnings at the stake and the religious wars that followed the Protestant Reformation. The injustices committed against women, the violation of women's rights and the historical denigration of women. The inactivity and silence of many Catholics during the Holocaust. The great jubilee of the year 2000 included a day of prayer for forgiveness of the sins of the church on 12 March 2000. On 20 November 2001, from a laptop in the Vatican, Pope John Paul II sent his first email apologizing for the Catholic sex abuse cases, 
the church backed stolen generations of Aboriginal children in Australia, and to China for the behaviour of Catholic missionaries in colonial times. Chapter 13 Health When he became Pope in 1978 at the age of 58, John Paul II was an avid sportsman. He was extremely healthy and active, jogging in the Vatican Gardens, weight training, swimming, and hiking in the mountains. He was fond of football. The media contrasted the new Pope's athleticism and trim figure to the poor health of John Paul I and Paul VI, the portliness of John XXIII and the constant claims of ailments of Pius XII. The only modern Pope with a fitness regimen, had been Pope Pius XI, who was an avid mountaineer. An Irish independent article in the 1980s labelled John Paul II the Keep Fit Pope. However, after over 25 years as Pope, two assassination attempts, one of which injured him severely, and a number of cancer scares, John Paul's physical health declined. In 2001 he was diagnosed as suffering from Parkinson's disease. International observers had suspected this for some time, but it was only publicly acknowledged by the Vatican in 2003. Despite difficulty speaking more than a few sentences at a time, trouble hearing, and severe osteoarthrosis, he continued to tour the world although rarely walking in public. Chapter 14, Death and Funeral Chapter 15 Section 1, Final Months Pope John Paul II was hospitalized with breathing problems caused by a bout of influenza on 1 February 2005. He left the hospital on 10 February, but was subsequently hospitalized again with breathing problems two weeks later and underwent a tracheotomy. Chapter 15 Section 2 Final Illness and Death On 31 March 2005, following a urinary tract infection, he developed septic shock, a form of infection with a high fever and low blood pressure, but was not hospitalized. Instead, he was monitored by a team of consultants, at his private residence. This was taken as an indication by the Pope, and those close to him, that he was nearing death, it would have been in accordance with his wishes to die in the Vatican. Later that day, Vatican sources announced that John Paul II had been given the anointing of the sick by his friend and secretary Stanislav Giewisch. The day before his death, one of his closest personal friends, Anna Teresa Tymieka visited him at his bedside. During the final days of the Pope's life, the lights were kept burning through the night where he lay in the papal apartment on the top floor of the Apostolic Palace. Tens of thousands of people assembled and held vigil in St. Peter's Square and the surrounding streets for two days. Upon hearing of this, the dying Pope was said to have stated, I have searched for you, and now you have come to me, and I thank you. On Saturday 2 April 2005, at approximately 1530 CSD, John Paul II spoke his final words in Polish, Pozwolsi mi odiczt ku domu ojka, to his aides, and fell into a coma about four hours later. The Mass of the Vigil of the Second Sunday of Easter commemorating the canonization of Saint Maria Faustina on 30 April 2000, had just been celebrated at his bedside, presided over by Stanislav Giewisch and two Polish associates. Present at the bedside was a cardinal from Ukraine, who served as a priest with John Paul in Poland, along with Polish nuns of the Congregation of the Sisters Servants of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, who ran the papal household. Pope John Paul II died in his private apartment at 2137 CSD of heart failure from profound hypotension and complete circulatory collapse from septic shock, 46 days before his 85th birthday. His death was verified when an electrocardiogram that ran for 20 minutes showed a flat line. He had no close family by the time of his death, his feelings are reflected in his words written in 2000 at the end of his last will and testament. Stanislav Jewish later said he had not burned the pontiff's personal notes despite the request being part of the will. Chapter 15 Section 3 Aftermath The death of the pontiff set in motion rituals and traditions dating back to medieval times. 
The right of visitation took place from the 4th of April 2005 to the 7th of April 2005 at St. Peter's Basilica. John Paul II's testament, published on the 7th of April 2005, revealed that the pontiff contemplated being buried in his native Poland, but left the final decision to the College of Cardinals, which in passing, preferred burial beneath St. Peter's Basilica, honoring the pontiff's request to be placed in bare earth. The Requiem Mass held on 8 April 2005 was said to have set world records both for attendance and number of heads of state present at a funeral. It was the single largest gathering of heads of state up to that time, surpassing the funerals of Winston Churchill and Josip Broz Tito. Four kings, five queens, at least seventy presidents and prime ministers, and more than fourteen leaders of other religions attended. An estimated four million mourners gathered in and around Vatican City. Between 250,000 and 300,000 watched the event from within the Vatican's walls. The Dean of the College of Cardinals, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, conducted the ceremony. John Paul II was interred in the grottos under the Basilica, the tomb of the Popes. He was lowered into a tomb created in the same alcove previously occupied by the remains of Pope John XXIII. The alcove had been empty since John XXIII's remains had been moved into the main body of the basilica after his beatification. Chapter 15, Posthumous Recognition Chapter 16 Section 1, Title The Great Upon the death of John Paul II, a number of clergy at the Vatican and laymen began referring to the late pontiff as John Paul the Great, in theory only the fourth pope to be so acclaimed. Cardinal Angelo Sodano specifically referred to John Paul as the Great in his published written homily for the Pope's funeral mass of repose. The South African Catholic newspaper The Southern Cross has referred to him in print as John Paul II the Great. Some Catholic educational institutions in the U.S. have additionally changed their names to incorporate the Great, including John Paul the Great Catholic University and schools called some variant of John Paul the Great High School. Scholars of canon law say that there is no official process for declaring a Pope Great, the title simply establishes itself through popular and continued usage, as was the case with celebrated secular leaders. The three popes who today commonly are known as Great are Leo I, who reigned from 440 to 461 and persuaded Attila the Hun to withdraw from Rome, Gregory I, 590 to 604, after whom the Gregorian chant is named, and Pope Nicholas I, 858 to 867, who consolidated the Catholic Church in the Western world in the Middle Ages. John Paul's successor, Benedict XVI, has not used the term directly in public speeches, but has made oblique references to the great Pope John Paul II in his first address from the Loggia of St. Peter's Basilica, at the 20th World Youth Day in Germany 2005 when he said in Polish, as the great Pope John Paul II would say, keep the flame of faith alive in your lives and your people, and in May 2006 during a visit to Poland where he repeatedly made references to the great John Paul and my great predecessor. Chapter 16 Section 2, Institutions Named After John Paul II Pope John Paul II High School John Paul the Great Catholic University John Paul the Great Catholic High School John Paul II Catholic Secondary School St. John Paul the Great Catholic High School Scholar in Foyle, Leakslip, Ireland John Paul II Gymnasium, Kaunas, Lithuania. Pope John Paul II High School in Olympia, Washington. Karl Vytila Building at Akmar Jaya Catholic University of Indonesia in Jakarta, Indonesia. St. John Paul II Chapel and Museum at Parque One Mall in Surabaya, Indonesia. St. John Paul II Minor Seminary, Minor Seminary and Tipolo City, Philippines. St. John Paul II Parish Community. St. John Paul II High School. St. John Paul II Academy Boca Raton, Florida. St. John Paul II Catholic High School. St. John Paul II Seminary. 
Chapter 16 Section 3, Beatification Inspired by calls of Santo Subito. Saint immediately, from the crowds gathered during the funeral mass that he celebrated, Benedict XVI began the beatification process for his predecessor, by passing the normal restriction that five years must pass after a person's death before beginning the beatification process. In an audience with Pope Benedict XVI, Camillo Ruinai, Vicar General of the Diocese of Rome, who was responsible for promoting the cause for canonization of any person who died within that diocese, cited exceptional circumstances, which suggested that the waiting period could be waived. This decision was announced on 13 May 2005, the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima and the 24th anniversary of the assassination attempt on John Paul II at St. Peter's Square. In early 2006, it was reported that the Vatican was investigating a possible miracle associated with John Paul II. Sister Marie Simone Pierre, a French nun and member of the Congregation of Little Sisters of Catholic Maternity Wards, confined to her bed by Parkinson's disease, was reported to have experienced a complete and lasting cure after members of her community prayed for the intercession of Pope John Paul II. As of May 2008, Sister Marie Simone Pierre, then 46, was working again at a maternity hospital run by her religious institute. I was sick and now I am cured, she told reporter Jerry Shaw. I am cured, but it is up to the church to say whether it was a miracle or not. On 28 May 2006, Pope Benedict XVI celebrated Mass before an estimated 900,000 people in John Paul II's native Poland. During his homily, he encouraged prayers for the early canonization of John Paul II and stated that he hoped canonization would happen in the near future. In January 2007, Cardinal Stanislaw Jewish announced that the interview phase of the beatification process, in Italy and Poland, was nearing completion. In February 2007, second-class relics of Pope John Paul II, pieces of white papal cassocks he used to wear, were freely distributed with prayer cards for the cause, a typical pious practice after a saintly Catholic's death. On 8 March 2007, the Vicariate of Rome announced that the diocesan phase of John Paul's cause for beatification was at an end. Following a ceremony on 2 April 2007, the second anniversary of the pontiff's death, the cause proceeded to the scrutiny of the Committee of Lay, Clerical, and Episcopal members of the Vatican's Congregation for the Causes of Saints, to conduct a separate investigation. On the fourth anniversary of Pope John Paul's death, the 2nd of April 2009, Cardinal Jewish, told reporters of a presumed miracle that had recently occurred at the former Pope's tomb in St. Peter's Basilica. A nine-year-old Polish boy from Gdansk, who was suffering from kidney cancer and was completely unable to walk, had been visiting the tomb with his parents. On leaving St. Peter's Basilica, the boy told them, I want to walk, and began walking normally. On 16 November 2009, a panel of reviewers at the Congregation for the Causes of Saints voted unanimously that Pope John Paul II had lived a life of heroic virtue. On 19 December 2009, Pope Benedict XVI signed the first of two decrees needed for beatification and proclaimed John Paul II venerable, asserting that he had lived a heroic, virtuous life. The second vote and the second signed decree certifying the authenticity of the first miracle, the curing of Sister Marie Simone Pierre, a French nun, from Parkinson's disease. Once the second decree is signed, the position is complete. He can then be beatified. Some speculated that he would be beatified sometime during the month of the 32nd anniversary of his 1978 election, in October 2010. As Monsignor Oda said, this course would have been possible if the second decree were signed in time by Benedict XVI, stating that a posthumous miracle directly attributable to his intercession had occurred, completing the positio. The Vatican announced on 14 January 2011 that Pope Benedict XVI had confirmed the miracle involving Sister Marie Simone Pierre and that John Paul II was to be beatified on 1 May, the Feast of Divine Mercy. The 1 May is commemorated in former communist countries, such as Poland, 
and some Western European countries as May Day, and John Paul II was well known for his contributions to communism's relatively peaceful demise. In March 2011 the Polish Mint issued a gold 1,000 Polish Zloty coin, with the Pope's image to commemorate his beatification. On 29 April 2011, John Paul II's coffin was disinterred from the grotto beneath St. Peter's Basilica ahead of his beatification, as tens of thousands of people arrived in Rome for one of the biggest events since his funeral. John Paul II's remains, which were not exposed, were placed in front of the basilica's main altar, where believers could pay their respect before and after the beatification mass in St. Peter's Square on 1 May 2011. On 3 May 2011 his remains were interred in the marble altar in Pier Paolo Cristofari Chapel of St. Sebastian, where Pope Innocent XI was buried. This more prominent location, next to the Chapel of the Pieta, the Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament, and statues of Popes Pius XI and Pius XII, was intended to allow more pilgrims to view his memorial. In July 2012, a Colombian man, Marco Fidel Rojas, the former mayor of Wheeler, Colombia, testified that he was miraculously cured of Parkinson's disease after a trip to Rome where he met John Paul II and prayed with him. Dr. Antonio Schlesinger Pedra Hita, a renowned neurologist in Colombia, certified Fidel's healing. The documentation was then sent to the Vatican Office for Sainthood Causes. In September 2020, Poland unveiled a sculpture of him in Warsaw, designed by Jerzy Kalina, and installed outside the National Museum, holding up a meteorite. In the same month, a relic containing his blood was stolen from the Spoleto Cathedral in Italy. Chapter 16 Section 4 Canonization to be eligible for canonization by the Catholic Church, two miracles must be attributed to a candidate. The first miracle attributed to John Paul was the above-mentioned healing of a woman's Parkinson's disease, which was recognized during the beatification process. According to an article on the Catholic News Service dated 23 April 2013, a Vatican Commission of Doctors concluded that a healing had no natural explanation, which is the first requirement for a claimed miracle to be officially documented. The second miracle was deemed to have taken place shortly after the late Pope's beatification on 1 May 2011, it was reported to be the healing of Costa Rican woman Floribeth Mora of an otherwise terminal brain aneurysm. A Vatican panel of expert theologians examined the evidence, determined that it was directly attributable to the intercession of John Paul II, and recognized it as miraculous. The next stage was for cardinals who composed the membership of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints to give their opinion to Pope Francis to decide whether to sign and promulgate the decree and set a date for canonization. On 4 July 2013, Pope Francis confirmed his approval of John Paul II's canonization, formally recognizing the second miracle attributed to his intercession. He was canonized together with Pope John XXIII. The date of the canonization was on 27 April 2014, Divine Mercy Sunday. The canonization Mass for Blessed Popes John Paul II and John XXIII was celebrated by Pope Francis on 27 April 2014 in St. Peter's Square at the Vatican. About 150 cardinals and 700 bishops can celebrated the Mass, and at least 500,000 people attended the Mass with an estimated 300,000 others watching from video screens placed around Rome. It is indicative of the morality of the Roman Catholic Church that it canonized a man who ignored the rape and abuse of thousands of children on his watch, while continuing to protect the archbishops and bishops who shielded the rapists and abusers. Chapter 16 Section 5, Beatification of the Pope's Parents On 10 October 2019, the Archdiocese of Krakow and the Polish Bishops' Conference approved Nihil Obst at the opening of the beatification cause of the parents of its patron Saint Pope John Paul II, Karol Wojtyla Sr. and Emilia Kaczorowska. It gained approval from the Holy See to open the diocesan phase of the cause on May 7, 2020. Chapter 16, Criticism and Controversy John Paul II was widely criticized for a variety of his views. He was a target of criticism from progressives for his opposition to the ordination of women and use of contraception, 
and from traditional Catholics, for his support for the Second Vatican Council and its reform of the liturgy. John Paul II's response to child sexual abuse within the Church has also come under heavy censure. Chapter 17 Section 1, Sex Abuse Scandals John Paul II was criticized by representatives of the victims of clergy sexual abuse for failing to respond quickly enough to the Catholic sex abuse crisis. In his response, he stated that there is no place in the priesthood and religious life for those who would harm the young. The Church instituted reforms to prevent future abuse by requiring background checks for Church employees and, because a significant majority of victims were boys, disallowing ordination of men with deep-seated homosexual tendencies. They now require dioceses faced with an allegation to alert the authorities, conduct an investigation and remove the accused from duty. In 2008, the Church asserted that the scandal was a very serious problem and estimated that it was probably caused by no more than 1% of the over 500,000 Catholic priests worldwide. In April 2002, John Paul II, despite being frail from Parkinson's disease, summoned all the American cardinals to the Vatican to discuss possible solutions to the issue of sexual abuse in the American Church. He asked them to diligently investigate accusations. John Paul II suggested that American bishops be more open and transparent in dealing with such scandals and emphasized the role of seminary training to prevent sexual deviance among future priests. In what the New York Times called unusually direct language, John Paul condemned the arrogance of priests that led to the scandals. Priests and candidates for the priesthood often live at a level both materially, and educationally superior to that of their families and the members of their own age group. It is therefore very easy for them to succumb to the temptation of thinking of themselves as better than others. When this happens, the ideal of priestly service and self-giving dedication can fade, leaving the priest dissatisfied and disheartened. The Pope read a statement intended for the American cardinals, calling the sex abuse an appalling sin, and said the priesthood had no room for such men. In 2002, Archbishop Julius Peets, the Catholic Archbishop of Poznan, was accused of molesting seminarians. Pope John Paul II accepted his resignation, and placed sanctions on him, prohibiting Peets from exercising his ministry as bishop. It was reported that these restrictions were lifted, though Vatican spokesperson Federico Lombardi strenuously denied this saying his rehabilitation was without foundation. In 2003, John Paul II reiterated that there is no place in the priesthood and religious life for those who would harm the young. In April 2003, a three-day conference was held, titled Abuse of Children and Young People by Catholic Priests and Religious, where eight non-Catholic psychiatric experts were invited to speak to near all Vatican dicasteries representatives. The panel of experts overwhelmingly opposed implementation of policies of zero tolerance such as was proposed by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. One expert called such policies a case of overkill since they do not permit flexibility to allow for differences among individual cases. In 2004, John Paul II recalled Bernard Francis Law to be archpriest of the Papal Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome. Law had previously resigned as Archbishop of Boston in 2002 in response to the Catholic Church sexual abuse cases after church documents were revealed that suggested he had covered up sexual abuse committed by priests in his archdiocese. Law resigned from this position in November 2011. John Paul II was a firm supporter of the Legion of Christ, and in 1998 discontinued investigations into sexual misconduct by its leader Martial Maciel, who in 2005 resigned his leadership and was later requested by the Vatican to withdraw from his ministry. However, Maciel's trial began in 2004 during the pontificate of John Paul II, but the Pope died before it ended and the conclusions were known. On November 10, 2020, the Vatican published a report which found that John Paul II learned of allegations of sexual impropriety against former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, who at time was serving as Archbishop of Newark, through a 1999 letter from Cardinal John O'Connor warning him that appointing McCarrick to be Archbishop of Washington, D.C., a position which had recently been opened, would be a mistake. 
John Paul II ordered an investigation, which stalled when three of the four bishops tasked with investigating claims allegedly brought back inaccurate or incomplete information. John Paul II planned on not giving McCarrick the appointment anyway, but relented and gave him the appointment after McCarrick wrote a letter of denial. He created McCarrick a cardinal in 2001. McCarrick would eventually be laicized after allegations surfaced that he abused minors. George Weigel, a biographer of John Paul II, defended the Pope's actions as follows, Theodore McCarrick fooled a lot of people, and he deceived John Paul II in a way that is laid out in almost biblical fashion in report. Chapter 17 Section 2 Opus Dei Controversies. John Paul II was criticized for his support of the Opus Dei Prelature and the 2002 canonization of its founder, Jose Maria Escrivá, whom he called the saint of ordinary life. Other movements and religious organizations of the Church went decidedly under his wing Legion of Christ, the Neocatechumenal Way, Schoenstatt, the Charismatic Movement, etc., and he was accused repeatedly of taking a soft hand with them especially in the case of Martial Maciel, founder of the Legion of Christ. In 1984 John Paul II appointed Joaquin Navarro Valls, a member of Opus Dei, as director of the Vatican Press Office. An Opus Dei spokesman said that the influence of Opus Dei in the Vatican has been exaggerated. Of the nearly 200 cardinals in the Catholic Church, only two are known to be members of Opus Dei. Chapter 17 Section 3 Banco Ambrosiano Scandal. Pope John Paul was alleged to have links with Banco Ambrosiano, an Italian bank that collapsed in 1982. At the center of the bank's failure was its chairman, Roberto Calvi, and his membership in the illegal Masonic Lodge propaganda due. The Vatican Bank was Banco Ambrosiano's main shareholder, and the death of Pope John Paul I in 1978 is rumored to be linked to the Ambrosiano scandal. Calvi, often referred to as God's banker, was also involved with the Vatican Bank, Istituto Polo Per di Religioni, and was close to Bishop Paul Marcinkus, the bank's chairman. Ambrosiano also provided funds for political parties in Italy, and for both the Somoza dictatorship in Nicaragua and its Sandinista opposition. It has been widely alleged that the Vatican Bank provided money for solidarity in Poland. Calvi used his complex network of overseas banks and companies to move money out of Italy, to inflate share prices, and to arrange massive unsecured loans. In 1978, the Bank of Italy produced a report on Ambrosiano that predicted future disaster. On 5 June 1982, two weeks before the collapse of Banco Ambrosiano, Calvi had written a letter of warning to Pope John Paul II, stating that such a forthcoming event would provoke a catastrophe of unimaginable proportions in which the Church will suffer the gravest damage. On 18 June 1982 Calvi's body was found hanging from scaffolding beneath Blackfriars Bridge in the financial district of London. Calvi's clothing was stuffed with bricks, and contained cash valued at US$14,000, in three different currencies. Chapter 17 Section 4, Problems with Traditionalists In addition to all the criticism from those demanding modernization, some traditionalist Catholics denounced him as well. These issues included demanding a return to the Tridentine Mass and repudiation of the reforms instituted after the Second Vatican Council, such as the use of the vernacular language in the formerly Latin Roman Rite Mass, ecumenism, and the principle of religious liberty. In 1988, the controversial traditionalist Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, founder of the Society of St. Pius X, was excommunicated under John Paul II because of the unapproved ordination of four bishops, which Cardinal Ratzinger called a schismatic act. The World Day of Prayer for Peace, with a meeting in Assisi, Italy, in 1986, in which the Pope prayed only with the Christians, was criticized for giving the impression that syncretism, and indifferentism were openly embraced by the papal magisterium. When a second day of prayer for peace in the world was held, in 2002, it was condemned as confusing the laity and compromising to false religions. Likewise criticized was his kissing of the Quran in Damascus, Syria, on one of his travels on 6 May 2001. 
His call for religious freedom was not always supported, bishops like Antonio de Castro Maia promoted religious tolerance, but at the same time rejected the Vatican II principle of religious liberty as being liberalist and already condemned by Pope Pius IX in his Syllabus Errorum, and at the First Vatican Council. Chapter 17 Section 5, Religion and AIDS John Paul II's continued the tradition of advocating for the culture of life and, in solidarity with Pope, Paul VI Humanae Vitae rejected artificial birth control, even in the use of condoms to prevent the spread of AIDS. Critics have said that large families are caused by lack of contraception and exacerbate third world poverty and problems such as street children in South America. John Paul II argued that the proper way to prevent the spread of AIDS was not condoms but rather, correct practice of sexuality, which presupposes chastity and fidelity. The focus of John Paul II's point is that the need for artificial birth control is itself artificial, and that principle of respecting the sacredness of life ought not be rent asunder in order to achieve the good of preventing AIDS. Chapter 17 Section 6 Social Programs there was strong criticism of the Pope for the controversy surrounding the alleged use of charitable social programs as a means of converting people in the Third World to Catholicism. The Pope created an uproar in the Indian subcontinent, when he suggested that a great harvest of faith would be witnessed on the subcontinent in the Third Christian Millennium. Chapter 17 Section 7 Dictatorships in Latin America John Paul visited General Augusto Pinochet. Chile's military ruler. According to the United Press International, Pope John Paul II preached the need for peaceful change and greater participation up and down Chile, but stayed away from direct confrontation with General Augusto Pinochet's military regime, disappointing Pinochet's opponents who had hoped the Pope would publicly condemn the regime and bless their campaign for a return to democracy. John Paul endorsed Pio Cardinal Laghi, who critics say supported the dirty war in Argentina who was on friendly terms with the Argentine generals of the military dictatorship, playing regular tennis matches with Navy's representative in the junta, Admiral Emilio Eduardo Macera. Chapter 17 Section 8, Ian Paisley In 1988, when Pope John Paul II was delivering a speech to the European Parliament, Ian Paisley, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party and moderator of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster, shouted I denounce you as the Antichrist. And held up a red banner reading Pope John Paul II Antichrist. Otto von Habsburg, an MEP for Germany, snatched Paisley's banner, tore it up and, along with other MEPs, helped eject him from the chamber. The Pope continued with his address after Paisley had been ejected. Chapter 17 Section 9, Medjugorje Apparitions A number of quotes about the apparitions of Medjugorje, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, have been attributed to John Paul II. In 1998, when a certain German gathered various statements that were supposedly made by the Pope and Cardinal Ratzinger, and then forwarded them to the Vatican in the form of a memorandum, Ratzinger responded in writing on the 22nd of July 1998, the only thing I can say regarding statements on Medjugorje ascribed to the Holy Father and myself is that they are complete invention. Similar claims were also rebuked by the Vatican's Secretariat of State. Chapter 17 Section 10, Beatification Controversy Some Catholic theologians disagreed with the call for the beatification of John Paul II. Eleven dissident theologians, including Jesuit professor José María Castillo and Italian theologian Giovanni Franzoni, said that his stance against contraception and the ordination of women as well as the church scandals during his pontificate presented facts which according to their consciences and convictions should be an obstacle to beatification. Some traditionalist Catholics opposed his beatification and canonization for his views on liturgy and participation in prayer with enemies of the church, heretics and non-Christians. Chapter 17, Personal Life Karl Vitilla was a Krakowia football team supporter. Having played the game himself as a goalkeeper, John Paul II was a fan of English football team Liverpool, where his compatriot Jerzy Dulic played in the same position. In 1973, while still the Archbishop of Krakow, 
Karol Wojtyla befriended a Polish-born, later American philosopher, Anna Teresa Tymieniecka. The 32-year friendship lasted until his death. She served as his host when he visited New England in 1976 and photos show them together on skiing and camping trips. Letters that he wrote to her were part of a collection of documents sold by Tymieniecka's estate in 2000, and eight to the National Library of Poland. According to the BBC the library had initially kept the letters from public view, partly because of John Paul's path to sainthood, but a library official announced in February 2016 the letters would be made public. In February 2016 the BBC documentary program Panorama reported that John Paul II had apparently had a close relationship with the Polish-born philosopher. The pair exchanged personal letters over 30 years, and Stoughton believes that Tymieniecka had confessed her love for Wojtyla. The Vatican described the documentary as more smoke than mirrors, and Tymieniecka denied being involved with John Paul II. Writers Karl Bernstein, the veteran investigative journalist of the Watergate scandal, and Vatican expert Marco Politi, were the first journalists to talk to Anna Teresa Tymieniecka in the 1990s about her importance in John Paul's life. They interviewed her and dedicated 20 pages to her in their 1996 book His Holiness. Bernstein and Politi even asked her if she had ever developed any romantic relationship with John Paul II, however one-sided it might have been. She responded, No, I never fell in love with the Cardinal. How could I fall in love with a middle-aged clergyman? Besides, I'm a married woman. Chapter 18 Section 1 People. Peter Lejak. Boleslav Taborski. Chapter 18 Section 2, Sources.